In the dark waters of the North Atlantic, the great passenger liner RMS Titanic came to a violent and mysterious end. Each of her passengers, unwitting players in a harrowing drama. The builder who would pronounce her dead. The brave men who refused to let her die. Thousands of people who struggled for their lives. Now, for the first time, a prominent Titanic historian will retell her tragic tale from the ship's actual decks. Haunting locations will take us back to pivotal moments during the epic disaster. Newly discovered artifacts are helping to piece together Titanic's untold stories. It's a moment in history we're still striving to understand. A part of our past impossible to forget. On the French research vessel Nadir, a countdown begins. The crew prepares for an unprecedented dive to one of the greatest shipwrecks in history, RMS Titanic. On Nadir's fantail, a prototype submersible, Nautil, is run through a final series of systems checks. She is one of a few submersibles able to dive more than 12,000 feet to reach Titanic. Historian Charles Haas is leading today's dive. His mission? To document key sites on the ship where critical events unfolded. To Haas, Titanic is a dramatic stage but it is the characters in the tragedy who draw him in. I think in order to get a full picture of what that night was like, you need to know the people who were involved in that uh, situation. By knowing the, the characters in the drama, by knowing the people, you get a much better insight into the, the great drama of that night. As part of Haas's mission, he will also look for artifacts, personal objects which may provide clues to Titanic's story. When Nortil leaves these decks, she will drop two and a half miles into the Atlantic, into a hostile world. place of freezing temperatures, bone-crushing pressure, and desolate darkness. If something goes wrong at the site, there is no chance of a rescue. In the control room, Nortil's position will be monitored by expedition leader George Tullock. I'm really proud of this expedition and this team. It's just a wonderful thing to be a part of. The Titanic is the piece of our history, and it, it's just special in every direction. 
Talek is joined by Titanic historian and Haas's writing partner, Jack Eaton. There are many things that still can be learned from Titanic, from the disaster, from the recollection of the people and of the events. There are some major mysteries that are still unsolved. From the bridge, the crew watches as Nautil freefalls to Titanic. A ship still giving up her secrets. For historians studying Titanic, much of what they know is based on testimony taken after the disaster. Hearings were held in both the United States and Britain, which investigated the reason for her sinking. Additional evidence turned up in rare diaries and letters. Now, artifacts retrieved from the ocean floor let us study tangible pieces of lost history. In their research, historians have learned most about passengers who traveled lavishly in first and second class. People such as Emily Ryerson and Lawrence Beasley have given us a glimpse of what that horrific night was like. Remarkably, personal accounts of Titanic continue to surface. New witnesses are emerging. Their stories have rarely been heard. As the submersible Nautil descends to Titanic, the crew prepares for arrival at the site. approach to the Titanic is, is pretty much like hovering over a beach in a helicopter. You see the sand rolling under you and you're navigating forward at maybe two or three miles an hour. All of a sudden, you see this immense object. And, and it is so, so immense that it completely fills the, the viewport. Your first reaction is, it's almost an automatic, oh my God. Titanic is it's still a very very beautiful ship to see the lines are, are so beautiful underwater and there's an awe or a, a reverence or a silence from realizing what occurred on these decks human stories of of personal tragedy that literally happened within the space that you can now see On April 4th, 1912, at midnight, Titanic docks at Southampton, England, where her first passengers will board. Under the direction of Haas, the crew of Nautil moves to the very spot where travelers first embarked.
the trip aboard Titanic actually began at this spot. These are the uh, B-deck doorways, the so-called shell doors. When you boarded the ship at Southampton in England, uh, you would essentially have gone through these doors and the purser would greet you there. These doorways mark the site where many first touched Titanic, a simple portal that became an entrance to history. In Southampton, boarding begins in the early morning. In command of the ship is Captain E.J. Smith. Smith's passenger list includes a who's who of the era. But the majority of the ship's passengers are third class. Titanic's owners hope to profit from immigrants such as Gerda and Edvard Lindell. The Lindells recently married are living in Skåne in southern Sweden. According to plans, Edvard will go to America first. Gerda will follow thereafter. Gerda, however, won't be separated from her new husband. At the last minute, she joins him. In a farewell gesture, Gerda drops roses along their route, leaving a trail behind. In Southampton, she writes a final postcard to her brother. Tomorrow, we shall go aboard Titanic. We have been down to see the Colossus. You should see what a beast it is. Greetings from Gerda. On the 10th of April, 1912, the Lindells join more than 2,000 others for Titanic's maiden voyage. On board, Edvard and Gerda meet fellow Swede August Wennerstrom. Wennerstrom is traveling under an assumed name. He's a political dissident leaving Sweden to live in America. Only one of these three passengers will survive the journey. Today, Titanic is a mass of twisted metal. But historian Charles Haas can see past the decay to the people who once walked these decks. As the crew of Nortil moves to a new location, 12,000 feet above them at the surface, members of the expedition team help navigate the wreck. Their destination is a third-class area at Titanic's bow. Hello, Charlie. Uh, how are you doing down there over we're working hard down here. We're looking now down at the, um, the third class uh, area, the, the so-called forward well deck. And it was here that third class passengers were enjoying themselves and, and coming out for recreation. From this place, the sunsets must have been dramatic. Third-class passengers, including the Lindells, spend early evenings strolling here, taking in the brisk sea air. Above the third-class promenade, first- and second-class passengers enjoyed uncompromising luxury. 
amenities included an exotic steam room, a state-of-the-art gymnasium, and lavish dining salons. For one first-class passenger, none of Titanic's palatial amenities are enticing. Mrs. Emily Ryerson's eldest son has been killed in a car crash in America. She's going to claim his body. She leaves her cabin rarely and eats in her room. The elegance of Titanic is meaningless to a mother in mourning. Haas is now one deck above Mrs. Ryerson's cabin. The team moves forward along the bow to one of Titanic's most famous locations. Between the first and second funnel, there was a magnificent dome which sat atop an area known as the Grand Staircase. There's, there's really no part of the Titanic that perhaps demonstrated the grandeur of the ship than this feature, which was called the Grand Staircase in first class. It was uh, surmounted by a wrought iron and, and glass dome. It penetrated uh, five or six decks down through the ship. As we can see now, however, the Grand Staircase is only a, a shattered leftover of its former self. For the first few days out at sea, the trip to America is uneventful. Then, on Sunday, the temperature drops dramatically. Titanic's chief designer, Thomas Andrews, spends his Sunday reviewing the ship's plans and inspecting the vessel for any subtle imperfections. Titanic is the greatest achievement to date of his ascending career. Harold Bride is one of the ship's two radio operators. Bride's partner is Jack Phillips. Throughout the day on Sunday, they receive six warnings of ice. Titanic's course is altered further south to avoid the danger. For passengers like the Lindells, the frigid air is enough to keep them indoors. Mrs. Emily Ryerson, however, makes a rare appearance outside her cabin to enjoy the quiet evening with a friend. Bruce Ismay, managing director for the company that owns Titanic, approaches Ryerson. Ismay shares a wireless message. First he showed the telegram, then he said, we're in among the icebergs. At the time, the conversation had no importance to me. I was very much overburdened with other things that were on my mind. First class passenger, Mrs. Emily Ryerson. In fact, few on board are concerned about ice. Titanic, after all, is unsinkable. The colossal scale of Titanic was unrivaled in her day. Her tragic sinking is one of few events in history that still holds such a grip on our imagination. Titanic holds the place in the public interest for a number of reasons, of course. The first is that it was probably the first major disaster to be covered by all of the media. 
There were some very early disasters in the 20th century, but Titanic was the first one that uh, made such a worldwide impact. People from the outset could identify with people on board the ship. And this is something that has remained over the years. Titanic stood as a pinnacle of human ingenuity in a time of unbridled optimism. There was great optimism that the age was going to improve. They had uh, such modern things as telephone and automobiles and even airplanes. And how far are these wonderful scientific devices going to take us? Above the wreck, Nortil moves to a haunting location in this story. The submersible is guided to the devastated remains of the forward funnel. A 150-foot funnel once occupied this cavernous hole. What we're passing over now is a huge uh, ventilation uh, system. Titanic had, of course, four funnels uh, connected to the boiler rooms. So what we're looking at here is a, a giant tube in effect. And if we were to pursue it further, we would find ourselves way down in the Titanic's boiler rooms. The massive boilers located deep in the belly of the ship were Titanic's source of power. On the day of the disaster, 24 boilers are feeding Titanic's enormous engines. The ship's speed, 21 and a half knots. That evening, Stoker Frederick Barrett begins his shift. In a few short hours, he will find himself in a pitched battle for survival. Second-class passenger, Lawrence Beasley, fills out a claim form so that he can retrieve his valuables from the purser's safe. Before retiring, Beasley takes in some quiet entertainment. After dinner, Mr. Carter invited all who wished to the saloon, and with the assistance at the piano, he started passengers singing hymns. He was curious to see how many chose hymns dealing with dangers at sea. Second-class passenger, Lawrence Beasley. Two hours before impact, wireless operator Jack Phillips receives a warning from the ship Masaba. Ice report, latitude 42 degrees north to 41 degrees 25 minutes north. Saw much heavy pack ice and great number of large icebergs. Wireless operator, Jack Phillips. Phillips doesn't realize the ice field lies directly in Titanic's path. Rather than report the warning to an officer, he places it on a spike. This simple act dooms Titanic. The warning should have been delivered to second officer Charles Lightoller, who was working on the bridge. The one vital report that came through but which never reached the bridge was received from the Mesaba. That delay proved fatal and was the main cause of the loss of that ship. Second officer, Charles Lightoller.
With the stage now set for disaster, the Nortiel approaches an eerie scene. We are hovering over the fallen forward mast, and you see the, the remains of the crow's nest. It was here that uh, Lookout Frederick Fleet uh, spotted an iceberg at 11.40 p.m. on the night of April 14, 1912. Fleet used the, uh, the crow's nest bell, but he, he essentially telephoned the bridge to report iceberg dead ahead. The iceberg is spotted a quarter mile away. Not enough distance to turn a ship that stretches four city blocks long. Officers steered Titanic from this location. The ship's wheel used to be attached to this device, called a telemotor. It is all that's left of the bridge. What we're seeing is the telemotor coming up. Here is really where Frederick Fleet's order was translated into action. Between Frederick Fleet's warning of the berg and the collision, there was just 37 seconds of time. As Titanic begins to turn, it looks as if the ship will clear the iceberg. Underwater ledge pierces Titanic's steel hull, buckling plates, causing thin separations in her side. There came what seemed to me nothing more than an extra heave of the engines. Nothing more than that. No sound of a crash or anything else. No sense of shock, no jar that felt like one heavy body meeting another. Second class passenger, Lawrence Beasley. I was just about ready for the land of Nod when I felt a sudden vibrating jar run through the ship. Not that it was by any means a violent concussion, but just a distinct and unpleasant break in the monotony of her motion. Second officer, Charles Lightoller. Deep below in third class, the impact is more obvious to the Lindells. August Wennerstrom. Captain Smith dispatches Titanic designer Thomas Andrews to inspect the damage to the ship. What Andrews sees is devastating. He reports to Captain Smith that Titanic is filling fast. A quick calculation reveals the ship has an hour, maybe two. Andrews realizes the deadly implications immediately. On board are more than 2,000 passengers and crew, but only enough lifeboats for just half of them. Following the collision, the ship is quiet again. Most first and second class passengers are still sleeping. Little do they realize a drama unfolds in the bow of the ship. Deep below, the front of Titanic is quickly flooding. The forward crew must abandon their positions. For the time being, Titanic's electricity is holding. Stoker Barrett and several others attempt to keep the water out of boiler room five. The men attach long hoses to the pumps. If they keep this section from flooding, they believe they can save the ship. They do not know that Titanic's designer has already declared her doomed.
From the boiler rooms, Nortiel travels to a location where another battle was fought. Above this fatal wound in the ship lies Titanic's mailroom. Among the greatest heroes of, of Titanic's story, I think, are the postal workers. Mm -hmm. There were more than 3,500 bags of mail on board the ship. And as the uh, water began flooding this area, the men's only thought was to try to rescue the mail that they had been placed in charge of. As Titanic's mailroom floods, the postal workers drag the mail to higher ground. As they work, the rising water rapidly pursues them, lapping at their heels at each level. Eventually, they are overtaken. This great hole marks the spot where the five postal workers died. They were Titanic's first victims. The next sight is perhaps the most wrenching. From the control room, the crew guides Nortiel to one of the evacuation areas. Titanic's lifeboats were stored on her uppermost decks. There were only 16, capacity for about 1,000. This ghostly crane lowered boats into the dark sea. Second officer Charles Lightoller worked at this very spot. As Lightoller and his men crank out the boats, passengers stand by and watch. Among them, there is utter disbelief. Nothing seems wrong. Why are they being asked to evacuate? Many passengers initially won't leave, and the first boats are launched virtually empty. Near this location, the radio operators frantically signal for assistance. In a desperate attempt to summon help, they send a newly adopted distress code, SOS. Titanic is one of the first ships in history to send the call. What we are looking at now is the uh, interior of the ship's wireless room. Here, the radio operators, uh, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, were given the information that the Titanic was doomed. They began immediately sending out distress signals. And so it was from this very room that these, t these two men worked very hard to save lives. Recognizing the fatal damage to Titanic, designer Thomas Andrews calmly works to prepare the passengers for the lifeboats. He knows, regardless of his effort, there will be a tragic loss of life. Third-class passengers August Wennerstrom and the Lindells are left on their own. As they head for the lifeboats, the stern begins to rise out of the water. We saw the sea climbing up the deck more quickly than before. I could see that everyone was clamoring aft and trying to keep from sliding down the slanting deck, which was growing steeper. Third-class passenger August Wernerstrom.
Deep in the belly of the ship, Frederick Barrett and the crew fear the red-hot boilers will explode when they come in contact with the icy seawater, so they extinguish the boilers. As each fire is put out, the hold fills with steam. Blinded by black dust and steam, one of Barrett's companions falls into an open manhole. His leg is shattered and Barrett drags him to a pump room. Nearly two hours after impact, a weakened wall caves in and the sinking of Titanic accelerates. Barrett escapes, but his companion will perish. When Barrett arrives on deck, his timing is perfect. He is quickly assigned to a lifeboat as an oarsman and is lowered away. Lawrence Beasley climbs aboard Barrett's boat when no more women or children are nearby. On the opposite side of the ship, one man wrestles with his conscience. His name is Masabumi Hasono. I tried to prepare myself for the last moment, making up my mind not to leave anything disgraceful as a Japanese. But I still found myself looking for any possible chance for survival. There were many men who attempted to squeeze in, but sailors refused them at gunpoint. I myself was deep in desolate thought. Even if I became the target of a pistol shot, it would be the same. And thus, I made a jump for the lifeboat. From the dark sea, Hasono looks back at embattled Titanic, her lights burning brightly, her stern rising perversely from the water. I saw a great number of passengers still frantically moving about on the deck, giving terrible shouts and cries for help. The scene was just horrible and eerie. Our lifeboat too was filled with sobbing and weeping women who had been worried about the safety of their husbands and fathers. It was all unbearably sad and hopeless. On board Titanic, Mrs. Ryerson refuses to leave her husband despite his best efforts to convince her otherwise. My husband said, when they say women and children first, you must go. And I said, why do I have to go on that boat? And he said, you must obey the captain's orders and I'll get in somehow. First class passenger, Mrs. Emily Ryerson. Hundreds of families are struggling with the same question. Should they separate? or stick together. With few lifeboats left, people take the threat of sinking seriously. challenge for the crew is to keep people from mobbing the remaining boats. Yeah. 
At 1.45 a.m., Emily Ryerson boards one of the last boats to be launched with her two daughters and one son. Her husband stays behind. Titanic's designer, Thomas Andrews, is last seen looking lost in a trance in the first-class smoking room. Andrews. 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 As Titanic's stern tilts higher, the Lindells and August Wennerstrom slide into the water. Relieved of his duty, Second Officer Lightoller also takes his chances in the sea. Immediately, he is sucked into a ventilation shaft. Although I struggled and kicked for all I was worth, it was impossible to get away. Every instant expecting myself shot down into the bowels of the ship. I was still struggling and fighting when suddenly a terrific blast of hot air came up the shaft and blew me right away up to the surface. From the surface, Lightoller witnesses the end of RMS Titanic. The bow of the ship was now rapidly going down and the stern was rising higher and higher out of the water, piling the people into helpless heaps around the steep decks and by the score into the icy water. Second officer, Charles Lightoller. As she swung up, her lights, which had shone without a flicker all night, went out suddenly, came on again for a single flash, and then went out altogether. Second class passenger, Lawrence Beasley. The stern stood for several minutes, black against the stars. And then the boat plunged out. Then began the cries for help, which seemed to go on forever. First class passenger, Mrs. Emily Ryerson. As Titanic plummets to the ocean floor, the most beautiful liner the world ever saw shatters into pieces. On the surface, the human drama continues. Charles Lighthaler manages to climb atop an overturned lifeboat. Some 13 men struggle here to keep their balance, to prevent slipping into the icy water. Wireless operators Bride and Phillips are among these men. Phillips will die of exposure before morning. The Lindells manage to find a lifeboat, but the boat overturns, sending them helplessly back into the sea. For how long a time I was away from the boat, I don't know. When I came back to the boat, it was filled with water. My friend, Edvard Lindell, had also got aboard. I saw Mrs. Lindell in the water and clasped her hand. I didn't have the strength to pull her aboard. Mr. Lindell looked straight ahead, never made a move or said a word. I realized that he'd frozen to death. After a half hour, I lost my grip and saw Mrs. Lindell disappear into the sea. Third class passenger, August Bernestrom.
More than 1,500 men, women, and children perish this night. Relics of their lives are strewn along the ocean floor. Artifacts like these provide the last clues to their stories. Among broken plates and debris, Haas makes a discovery. He finds and retrieves a device called a telegraph that was used to signal the engines. Your emotional attachment to a particular object eventually evolves into a, a, a great deal of, of uh, anxiousness about its future. And when you see the artifacts being brought up, and in particular when you see them being conserved, um, that anxiousness is, is replaced by a great, great deal of uh, happiness that, that you've preserved them for the future. After a day of exploration, Nautil returns to the surface with precious cargo. On the fan tail of Nadir, the newly discovered artifact is shared with the crew. Well, history's progressed another notch there, Charles. I'm really quite overwhelmed by that. In a warehouse in Hamburg, Germany, people line up to visit an extraordinary exhibit of titanic artifacts. Historians Charles Haas and Jack Eaton and expedition leader George Tulloch take in the emotional display. They have come to see fragments of history, some of which they have helped to rescue from certain oblivion. Certain objects here played a critical role during Titanic's final hours. The giant wrenches used by the men in the boiler room remind us of those who struggled to keep Titanic afloat. Men like Frederick Barrett. Barrett survived the disaster and continued to work most of his life out at sea. One of Titanic's brass bells, a symbol of her elite officers, including second officer Charles Lightoller. Lightoller was the only senior officer to survive Titanic. He retired unceremoniously. During World War II, he used his yacht in daring missions to aid the British war effort. This claim check, number 208, belonged to Lawrence Beasley and it was retrieved from the ocean bottom. Beasley lived to be 89 and write one of the most significant accounts of the Titanic tragedy. Women's jewelry reminds us that many of Titanic's survivors were widowed that night. When Mrs. Ryerson arrived in New York, she would bury her son who was killed in a car crash and mourn her lost husband. Mrs. Ryerson died at the age of 76. Masabumi Hasono lived reclusively and rarely spoke of Titanic. His rare written account has now become a part of history. Hasono lived to be 69 and died in Japan. August Wennerstrom survived Titanic. He spent most of his life in America and died in Culver, Indiana. This is the wedding band of Gerda Lindell. 
It was retrieved from the lifeboat where both she and her husband lost their lives. These objects are the last remnants of the Titanic disaster. They forge a link across a century to a vanished time. This clarinet and these letters of love found in a man's suitcase give us an intimate glimpse into a life we would have known nothing about. A life, like many others, forever changed by Titanic. Of the 2,228 individuals aboard Titanic, we only know the experiences of perhaps half. Some of their stories have been told and fully developed. But even to this day, most of Titanic's stories still remain untold. <laughs> 